without further ado, I want to hand it over to uh, Samir. Samir is a member of our uh, engineering team here at Google, been at Google for a long time. Um, Samir. So as Ari said, I've been at Google for a while. Uh, joined Google in 2004. Um, and I joined the Go team formally relatively recently, in January. Um, but I've been using Go for a little over two years. Uh, I'm a systems infrastructure type developer. I work primarily on distributed systems, storage infrastructure, networking infrastructure, RPC layer, all that sort of thing. And the thing that really attracted me to Go were the concurrency primitives. And so about half this talk is going to focus on Go's concurrency. Uh, but the first half is going to really start with the basics, walk you through a bit of the syntax, and talk about, in particular, Go's uh, alternative to the traditional object-oriented programming model. Go has an interesting way of providing methods and interfaces on types. But let's start with some background first. So uh, I'm going to try to keep the font bigger on the slides that can afford it, but it's going to get tight a little later. There's a lot of code in this talk. Um, why bother with a new language? Uh, static, statically typed languages, and uh, as of 2007, which is when the Go project began, we had a lot of use of Java and C++ and Google, and there were other various other languages that have been popular. Um, but the statically typed languages tended to get more and more bureaucratic, and while they provided you a lot of efficiency and a lot of safety with compile time checking, they seemed to just get more and more complex over time. And there seemed to be a reaction in the programming community to switch back to dynamic language, dynamically typed languages, where you had less checking, a lot more freedom, a lot more rapid programming and iteration, but you lost so much of the safety. Um, you tend to make errors that you don't detect on runtime, and you pay a high runtime cost. These languages tend to be have worse runtime performance than the static languages. And the biggest problem tends to be when you want to write big programs, big collaborative projects. These dynamic languages just tend, the model just tends to break down. Um, another big trend, we've all heard it year after year, is that uh, you know, instead of processors getting faster, you're going to have concurrent programming. You know, multiprocessors, you want to do more in parallel, more concurrently. There's a bit of a distinction between concurrency and parallelism I'll get into later. Um, but historically, concurrent programming has been hard. Uh, there's thread models, there's event models, there's locking and condition variables, and there's generally a lot of headache because it's hard to map those models to your brain. And Go adopts a particular concurrency model that I'll get into that I find much easier to map, and I hope you will too. Uh, the classic trade-off has been speed or reliability or simplicity. Pick two, or sometimes one. Go's trying to hit a sweet spot in that space. So Go started in 2007, and the quote that you'll see here and there is from Rob Pike. Consensus drove the design. Nothing went into the language until Ken Thompson, Robert Griesemer, and Rob Pike all agreed that it was right. Some features didn't get resolved until after a year or more of discussion. And you'll see as I go through Go, there are things that are missing. There are things that are, your favorite language feature may not be there. And it's probably not there for a reason, with a couple of exceptions. Um, and that's something we could probably cover in Q&A if you were interested. Um, the first release of Go was in November 2009, so that's two years later. And just last month, we've had the Go version 1. And this is intended to be a stable release of the language for years, meaning programs you write today should be usable for years. And this is the intent here is to allow companies and people who write programming books and you know people who want to build a program and just have it work and run to be able to start with Go 1 and make good progress. So what is Go? Um, it's an open source programming language, golang.org is the home page, and there's all sorts of information. You can find the entire source for the compiler, the runtime, everything. And there's a huge standard library, all the sources there. It's a general purpose language. Initially, it was really targeted at systems programming, but it, you know, as people gained experience with it, we realized it really is a lot more general than that. Um, it's concise, expressive, and readable. Now, you can get concise without readable, if you think about Perl. And you can get expressive with a lot of typing. Um, Go's syntax allows you to omit a lot of the things that you already know or don't need to know, but the critical elements are there. And you're going to see a lot of Go code in this talk. Um, Go statically typed, so the compiler does, you know, will check for dumb errors. And you know, for the most part, big programs hang together, can hang together really well. But Go's interface model is a little different. 
And it gives you a bit of the feel of duct typing you'll find in Python or other dynamic languages. And that actually allows your program to be much more modular. And I'll go into that as well. Goes garbage collected. Um, and that tends to be very important, especially when you're dealing with concurrent programs. Uh, you have, there's a lot of, there would be a lot of bookkeeping otherwise. It's compiled to native machine code. Um, it runs fast, and it also compiles really fast. Go's syntax and you know, overall language design is, one of its goals was to compile big programs quickly. It has a strict dependency model. Um, and if you actually go and play with some of the Go open source tools, you can compile entirely from source, no make files at all, because of the way Go's, the Go language is designed. And again, Go is especially good for concurrent programming. So if you deal with distributed systems or you deal with systems that you want to take advantage of parallelism in your machine, take a look at Go. All right, let's start with Hello World. Um, so here's Hello World written in Go. Uh, Go programs are Unicode, so you can write world however you like. And uh, shift, enter, that was a compile and run. Here's the output down at the bottom. Um, I can edit my program in the browser. I can type too, really. Compile and run, there's hello again. Um, this is running a modified version of the Go Tour, which is hosted at tour.golang.org. That's an excellent introduction to the language. It all runs in your browser. That uh, is running compiles on uh, a compile farm that we host and therefore has some restrictions. I'm running this locally, and therefore I can do anything I want. Hello World 2.0. So let's take Hello World and you know make it web-enabled. Uh, this code right here is, I'll zoom in and zoom out just to try and make it readable. But here's your main. Um, you've got uh, your, let me start at the beginning. Package main, every Go program begins in, begins in package main. We're importing two packages, a formatting package and the net HTTP package. Um, and func main is the entry point of the program. Uh, HTTP dot, that's referencing a function from pa the package HTTP. The last component of this path name is the package name locally by default. You can give it a local name if you want. Handle func says handle the root URL with the local function handler. And listen and serve means block and serve HTTP requests on local port 8080. My handler function, it's taking two arguments, a uh, response writer, which allows us to write data back to the client, and the, URL and the HTTP request. Um, I'm going to extract the name as, the, first, as uh, the URL path minus the first component and call fprintf to write my response, just hello, comma, whatever that first path component is. So I, if I start that running, we're going to block here. Yeah, allow that to connect. Um, let's pull this up at a tab. Here is hello world. If I change it to hello world 2, Hello world too. So I've got a little locally running web server in uh, rather few lines of code. Um, this is showing off uh, a bit of the design of Go's core packages. Uh, they really are the. We've done a lot of work to make the core packages useful and to allow you to get a lot done pretty quickly. Um, so let's see. Import HTTP imports the package named HTTP. Um, in handler, what was the type of name? Notice right here, I didn't write any types. Um, and let, this gets to a lot of what helps make Go, make Go concise. Go is a simple type system. Uh, it's statically typed, but you get a lot of type inference, and that saves a lot of repetition. If we take some examples, you know, in Java, if I have a date, I, have to, I can still have to say what type now has. It's a date now, and that's a new date. In C or C++, you know, I'm still providing the types. Um, in Go, I can just say now colon equals time dot now, and that has a, a type. The type is time.time. .time. It's the type time in the time package. Um, I colon equals one. That's an integer. Pi is math.pi. Well, I don't know what exactly type that is, but I can use it because it's pi. Um, greeting colon equals ho hello. That's a string. And uh, essentially, it, at the program level, to declare a variable, at the top level, you just say var, and then the variable name, and then the type. By default, it's zero. You get zero initialized memory. I can define, a, I have, there's a block syntax for variables for you know, large sets of declarations, and they infer, right? So x, uh, x is declared to be a variable initialized to 1, y and z are 2 and 3. When you have multiple initializations, you initialize each one separately. Uh, within a function, you can use the same var syntax, but you also get this shorthand, uh, Python Java colon equals false comma no, and then I can pass those off all to print line, 
and get 0, 1, 2, 3, true, false, no. Right? Um, so font is doing the right thing for each type, and that's also part of the strength of that package. All right, types and functions. To declare a new type, I'm using the type keyword here. This is a type vertex. That is a structure that contains two members, x and y, each of type float 64. I can define a function, func vertex to string. It takes a vertex, returns a string, and it's just doing the sprintf call to format it with parens around vx and vy. In my main, I'll declare a vertex, I'll initialize x and y to 3 and 4, and I'll print it out, 3, 4. But we can do better. Go syntax makes this easier. First of all, Go has excellent composite literals. Now, what are composite literals? So Go has a set of composite types, including structs, built-in maps, arrays, slices, which you can think of as a subsection of an array. Um, so those are the basic composite types. And uh, of course, you can nest. You have structs and nesting, uh, nesting other structs and maps and so on. And you can declare these entirely. You can declare these values and valuable values in your program. And this really saves a lot of typing. It saves, oftentimes saves having to write even a constructor for your type if all you're doing is dealing with a plain old data type and you want to just initialize it to a structured value. So here, all I've done is replaced var v vertex vx vy 3, 4 with v colon equals vertex 3, comma 4. This is using positional initialization. So I get the same 3, 4. If I remove this and instead say y colon 3, I get zero initialization for the x and three for the y. Um, the zero, using zero values as sensible defaults is very common in Go, right? You know, bool's default to false. So it tends to be that if you have a type like this um, that has, say, a bunch of fields, you want the zeros to be sensible, and then you just initialize what you need, and the type is usable just like that. For example, the mutex in the sync package, it defaults to an unlocked mutex, right? It's sort of how you expect. Um, so you can just declare a mutex on the stack. It's unlocked. You can lock it and unlock it, and it all just works. Um, methods, right. So going from vertex to string, that's, of course, we typically don't write something like vertex to string. We just want to say v.string. Well, you can define methods in Go, and you can attach a method to any type you define, right? So all that changed here is that I replaced vertex to string with a parameter vertex with a function that has a receiver, vta vertex. And a receiver looks like an argument list that appears before the method name. It only contains one thing. Um, within this method, I, you know, I gave the receiver a name. I gave it the name v. So the, actually, the method definition is exactly the same. Uh, you can call the receiver whatever you want. It's conventional to give it a short name uh, from your type. And this, of course, works just the same as the previous program. All right, so we can do more. We're going to get a little tight here, but I'll zoom in again. Um, I can attach methods to any type I define. And types don't have to be structs. I can define a Celsius and Fahrenheit types that are each float 32s. Uh, those are distinct types. And I'll, get in, I'll show you an example of what that means. I can attach to the Celsius uh, type a string method, you know, and it's going to print whatever the float value is to two precision degrees Celsius. Same for Fahrenheit, degrees Fahrenheit. And I can define, define a conversion that takes a Celsius value and returns a Fahrenheit value doing the standard conversion. And in my main program, I'm going to define a Celsius value and print uh, C equals its Fahrenheit value. And the 100 equals 212 Fahrenheit. Great. Seems to work. If I try and mix Celsius and Fahrenheit values in computation, I get a compiler error. Um, and that was, again, a, that was a reasonably fast compile, in my opinion. Um, invalid operation. See, you know, this expression, mismatch type Celsius and Fahrenheit. Useful compiler, compiler errors is another thing that the Go team really strives hard to do. Um, now, you might have noticed that I didn't type dot .string anywhere. It just worked. Here's where we get into Go's interface model. model. Um, the font package defines an interface called stringer, and it looks like this. It has uh, one method which is a string and it returns a you know, method called string that returns a string. That's the signature of the method in this interface. All that interfaces in Go is a set of methods. And a type implements an interface if it implements that set of method signatures. That's it. You don't have to say implements anywhere. There's no explicit declaration of an intent to declare an interface. This is huge for decoupling your code and providing modularity. right? Let's go into a little more detail. I can also create a value that's an interface, right? So I can say a var s, which is a stringer, 
Uh, I can create a vertex in Celsius, which is what you've seen before. I can put a vertex in a stringer. I can put a I can assign a Celsius to a stringer. Either one works because those are all valid assignments. And we're checking at compile time that those are valid assignments. Uh, if I print this out, I get the vertex, I get the Celsius, and I get whatever was in the stringer. The last thing I put in there was Celsius, so that's what I get. Uh, the rest of this is what you've seen before. Um, let me see. So one example that I like to point out for why having interfaces that no one else has to see is useful. Um, well, for one thing, this stringer interface I hear is in my package main. It's not the stringer that was defined up in format. Um, it still works because Vertex is defining the right method that Thumped expects. Right? Um, if you like testing your code, you'll like these interfaces. Because if you have a module that depends on, say, a number of uh, incoming types, and it calls certain methods on those types, often if you want to write a unit test, you end up writing mocks or fakes for all those types. And sometimes you just care about a fraction of the methods on the types you're receiving. Say it's a database handle. Uh, you might only be calling query or read. You might not be opening and closing database connections. You might just need some restricted access. In Go, you can, within your package, define just the interface that you depend on. And in your test, just mock that part out. Now you've isolated exactly the code you care about. Whoever defined that database type didn't, doesn't know about the interface you defined, and yet everything still hangs together properly. All right, Hello World 2.1. So here, this is, again, that uh, web server serving Hello World. Uh, but I'm going to emphasize on the interfaces I'm using. Uh, in the HTTP package, I've got a handler interface. And it has, I love the line wrapping, a serve HTTP method with the response writer and request. So any type that implements that interface can serve HTTP via this package. And the fumpt package, uh, the fumpt.printf can write to any value that implements io.writer. Uh, and a writer can take a slice of bytes, and it returns how many were written in an error. Right, so I'm showing off a few things here. Go has multiple return values, uh, and this is often how we signal errors. And Go has slices, which is kind of like an array. There's more, I'm not going to get into slices very much in this talk. You'll see them used. I'll give you references to where you can find out more later. So in my code, I'm going to find a type hello, which, has, which is struct with uh, a greeting string in it. Hello serve HTTP method. It's going to take that first element uh, of the slice of a URL path. And it's going to print to the response writer the greeting, comma, the name. In my main, I'm going to say I'm going to create an instance of a hello and set the greeting to namaste. And let's start that server running. Uh, open a new tab. Namaste world. Fantastic. Um, and so this is all still statically checked, right? Um, the fact that hello is implementing the right thing uh, is what makes it work. If I delete the P from HTTP, I get a compiler error. Cannot use H type hello as a handler in this ar argument. It's missing the serve HTTP method. I find that pretty informative, right? So just because you're getting this power doesn't mean you're losing clarity. All right, we're going to switch to my favorite topic, concurrency. Um, this is what made me fall in love with Go. Go's concurrency model is based on communicating sequential processes, also known as CSP, which was described in the 70s by C.R. Hoare. Um, the idea here is that you have multiple concurrent executing uh, processes that are exchanging data. Um, and in Unix, we see this quite a bit. We have uh, you can have streams of tools that are communicating via pipes, processing via pipes. So here I'm finding some files. I'm sending that output to grep to look for certain files matching a pattern. And I'm sending that output to uh, count the words and uh, the lines in each file. Each of these tools, find grep, XRX, and WC, is designed to do one thing and do it well. And it's the composition of these that gives us the power. Uh, in the real world, we see this pattern quite a bit. And I think this is one of the important points about why thinking about Go concurrency in Go is a little easier. Because it does map to how we really think about concurrency. In the real world, we assign individual tasks to individuals, and we connect them with communication or transfer of goods and services. Factory assembly lines is a big one, right? This was a huge deal that to get a car and a Model T produced quickly, you wanted all these stations working each on the, their own small job, and they're each proceeding as fast as they can go on the inputs they're receiving and sending the outputs down the line, right? So they're all working concurrently. 
all working in parallel, and they're passing data, namely the various stages of the car, down the line. Uh, but it doesn't have to be a linear connection, right? You can have a tree of connections. So if you think of a phone tree, this is the way a family might disseminate some news in the old days. You know, mom calls, you know, her sisters, their sisters call, you know, their brothers and sisters, and it sort of spreads out recursively, and all of a sudden everyone knows. This is pre-Twitter. Um, and software projects, which we all know and love, you have a big task. You break it up into teams. The teams break it up across individuals. Things proceed concurrently with various synchronization in terms of information passed between them. The Go analog, Go routines, connected by channels. Go routines, they're like threads in that they share memory, but they're much, much cheaper. You can have programs with thousands or hundreds of thousands of these. Go routines have smaller segmented stacks. That means that they start off in the current implementation at, say, 4K. So a 4K stack, you can have a lot of those. And the stack grows dynamically as needed. Um, you can have many Go routines per operating system thread. Even a Go program that's using a single thread to multiplex its Go routines can get huge amounts of I.O. parallelism. And if you have more, if you, if you give the Go runtime more CPUs, it'll use them. It'll multiplex the Go routines over those CPUs. This is all managed by the Go runtime. All right. So we start a new Go, I'm going to talk through this and I'll zoom out on the code. You start a new Go routine with a Go keyword, right? Take, just take a function invocation like f, x, y, z and put Go in front of it. That just starts that invocation running in a new Go routine. Um, so the evaluation of these various symbols, f, x, y, and z, happens in the current Go routine, and then the execution starts in the new Go routine. Um, Go routines all run in the same address space. They share memory, just like threads do. Um, and so if you want them to actually uh, have synchronized access, you need to synchronize properly. And there's a sync package, standard package, that provides mutexes and condition variables, but we can do better, and we will with channels. Um, let's go into this example real quick. We have a function main. I'm going to give it a random seed. And I'm going to launch one Go routine it, that calls this function say with the parameter world. And in the main Go routine, I'm going to call say as well with parameter hello, with the arg hello. Say takes a string. It loops five times. It sleeps for a random duration. And it prints the string. So if I run that, I get some random sequence of world and hello. If I uh, run it again, different random seed, I get a different sequence. Well, that's fine and good, but you know, unless we can know, say, when say completed and what it produced, that's not terribly useful. This is where channels come in. A channel is a typed conduit through which you can send and receive values. And there's an operator for this in the language, the channel operator. So if I have ch is a, is a channel value, I can send a value v to it with, uh, well, with this syntax. Similarly, the expression received from channel is that's a typed expression. It gives me, you know, it gives me a value of the type of that channel, right? So here's how I can receive a value and assign it to v. Right? Data always flows in the direction of the arrow. Channels must be created using the built use the built-in function make. So I would say make chan int. That's a channel of integers. Um, by default, channels provide not only data transfer, uh, but also synchronization. A sender and receiver, uh, a send will block until some other Go routine is ready to receive. Similarly, a receive will block until a value is ready to be sent. Once that happens, once those two meet up, then they each, uh, then the communication happens and they each can make progress again. So let's see how that works. Let's take this slice of integers and sum it, but sum it in parallel with two Go routines. We're going to make a channel of integers and assign it to C. We're going to start two Go routines and give half the slice to each. And then we're going to receive from the channel twice. We start two Go routines, we expect two results. And then we're going to print, the, print what we receive from each Go routine and the final sum. All right. So this, this slice syntax is roughly what you'd expect from other languages. You know, if I omit it, this is zero to halfway. This is halfway to the end, right? Our func sum is going to take a slice of integers. And slices know their own length. So you know, if I'm iterating over this slice, it's just the part that we gave sum. And this c is a channel of integers. So this sum, the job of sum is to sum up the integers that in the slice we gave it and send it on c. So it's just going to loop in the normal way. 
accumulate those into sum and send it to C. So if I send that out, I get 17 minus 5 and 12. Why? Um, this part is 17. This part is minus 5, and the overall sum is 12. Right? So you can imagine distributing the job more widely. Right? You can imagine uh, deciding how many go routines to create at runtime with a loop. Um, and we'll get into examples that do exactly that. Um, what really helps here is that I'm writing essentially straight line code. I'm not using any mutexes or condition variables. That's all the synchronization and all the data exchange is implicit in these communication operators. All right, channels can be buffered, uh, which essentially is a way of instead of having blocking sends and receives, they can uh, they can sends can proceed freely if there's space in the buffer, and receives can proceed if there's elements in the buffer. Um, so sends to a buffer channel block only when the buffer is full, receives block when the buffer is empty. So here I'm making a channel of integers that has space for two elements. I send to it twice and receive from it twice. So I get I get one and two out of channel. It's a FIFO order, right? Um, if I decrease, if I remove the buffer, what do I get? All go routines are asleep. Deadlock. Uh, deadlocks in other languages are really a pain point, but in go routine they're actually pretty easy to deal with because you get a nice error message that says, hey, on line seven is where this go routine is stuck. And stuck trying to send on this channel. In fact, it says it's stuck trying to send on a channel. Um, so what happened? Well, I have a channel that has no buffer and I only have this one go routine, there's no receiver. And as I said before, you know, in a non-buffered channel, sends are going to block. So let's give it a buffer, but we're going to only give it one buffer. What happens then? Another deadlock, but wait, it made it a line further to eight because the one proceeded and went to the buffer and two made it, th but then two got stuck because no one's receiving. Give it two buffers or three, then it works. Um, so buffers really provide a way to sort of grease the wheels and to allow, you know, go routines to say producing a lot of data to push data into a buffer and then have one or possibly a, a bunch of go routines feeding off that channel. And actually, <clears throat> this idea of having many to one or one to many or many to many communication through a single channel is something that often comes up and bring, gives you a lot of power. <clears throat> Range and close, these are really just conveniences in syntax. If you have a channel that you're using, you have, say, a producer or generator of values, and you have a consumer that wants to consume until the producer says, I'm done, range and close your friend. So you can close a channel. It's basically a way of indicating no more values will be sent. Uh, this only makes sense in the one-to-many or the one-to-one -one case of uh, generating data. So I have a Fibonacci function. It's going to generate n values from the Fibonacci sequence and send them on this channel, and then close the ch channel here. right? So I start with 1, 1. Each time I run the iteration, I send my x. I do the Fibonacci update. I loop. Um, I'm showing off here a bit of parallel assignment. x comma y gets y comma x plus y. This works. You can use it to swap x and y, you know, parallel assignment um, as atomic semantics. So in my main, I'm creating a channel with a buffer of size 10. I'm asking for 10, the first 10 values of Fibonacci. Capacity of C is just, that's just evaluating to 10, which is the size of the buffer of C. And I'm using this range primitive. Range works for a bunch of our built-in types. Range, you can range over slices, you can range over maps, you can range over, uh, and you can range over channels. And in the case of channels, it means con continue until the channel's closed. So here, I'm uh, consuming the, the values from the channel and then main exits when I get all 10. The thing, to me, the key thing that makes this all really work is a select statement. Because this is how you deal with programs that need to deal with communicating to multiple other entities, either multiplexing or demuxing or pulling together information from multiple sources, dealing with ticks from a clock and at the same time dealing with communication, select is uh, the key component here that sort of wraps it all up. Um, a select statement looks like a switch. Uh, it's a switch that blocks until some com communication can proceed, right? So each case is a communication, right? You can have uh, a case that's a send, a case that's a receive, and you could also optionally have a default case if you don't want to block, right? And the default will proceed if none of the other communications are ready, right? So without a default, the select statement will just block until one of the cases can proceed, and exactly one will proceed. If more than one could proceed, then it's selected proper random, right? And that's important for scheduling properties. Um, so my example, I'm just going to use the same Fibonacci uh, example, but instead of telling the Fibonacci function how many 
uh, numbers to generate, I'm going to pass it two channels. One is the channel on which I want it to send the values. The other is a quit channel, which I'm really just using as a signal, right? When, when I want the, to stop getting Fibonacci values, I'm going to give it something over this quit channel. And so Fibonacci is going to loop. It's going to select and see, can I sem send the receiver a value? If so, update and loop again. If I get quit, print quit and return. So here in my main, I'm making the two channels. I'm calling Go Fibonacci. I'm looping 10 times. You know, I'm choosing how often, how much to loop. I can keep going for as long as I want. Receiving that value and then telling it to quit. Um, hey, look at that. All right, there we go. So here's my output. Uh, something's missing. I didn't see quit, and yet main exited. What happened? Well, detail. The Go program ends when main ends. So if you wanted to see quit, you'd have to make sure that uh, main waited for it. So that's important for just making sure your program lives forever. As in our earlier, earlier HTTP server examples, often main ends with blocking on, say, serving something. Um, if you wanted to just block at the end of your main and let other Go routines run, you can just have an empty select statement. As I said, a select, select statement blocks until some case can proceed. If there are no cases, it blocks forever. Let's go into a real, well, semi-real example, at least one that illustrates how you put a lot of these techniques together to really handle a, a systems problem that I found hard and was something that I've used Go to solve. So what does Google search do? Well, given a query, return a page of search results and maybe some ads. But how do we get the search results? Well, what's really happening here is we're sending your query to a bunch of backends in parallel and then mixing the results. We're sending it to web and to image and to YouTube and to maps and to news and to various other places. Well, how would you implement this? So think for a moment about your favorite language and how you would actually implement this. And then I'll show it to you and go. 1.0. All right, Google search 1.0. Let's define a couple types. Let's say our, our result from a search backend is just a string. Obviously, we can define that to something fancier later. And a search, a backend search, is just a function that takes a query string and returns a result. All right? So let's create a couple of fake stubs for web searches, uh, for our searches. So we have a web search, image search, video search. They're all just fake searches that have these various names. And then our Google function is going to take a query and return a bunch of results in a slice. And here we're just going to issue these requests uh, in serial. So we're going to issue web, image, and video. We're going to append them to this result slice and return. Um, all fake search is doing is it's taking some name for our fake search and returning a search function. So this is showing off Go has first class functions and closures. I could say fake search with kind string. I can declare here a closure using a function literal that closes on that kind here. And all this is doing is sleeping for a random duration and then returning the result string, the, the, a string that says, you know, web result for some query. In main, let's start with a random seed. Let's record our start time, time.now, get our results, return our elapsed time, time.since start. This is all standard time package methods and functions, rather. Uh, we'll print our result and print our elapsed time. OK, we got a web result, an image result, and a video result. In 123 milliseconds, we run again. 154 milliseconds. 163. Oh, 33. We got a fast result. Great. Oh, 213. Bad luck. This does not meet the Google bar. This is too slow. How do we go faster? Well, Google search. I missed 2.0. I skipped ahead to 2.1. Let's invoke these concurrently. Uh, this is where I get we get to show off the syntax. I'm going to zoom out just so I, I can flip back and forth a bit and show you the difference. Keep your eye on this ball right here where I'm invoking web and query. We're going from invoking web image video like this to invoking it like this, right? Where I create a channel to receive three results. I say go, and this is another little closure, uh, invoke web and send its result in this channel, invoke image and video. And then I'm going to loop three times, receive three results, and append it to my results vector in return. The rest is unchanged, right? I just changed this little bit here. And what happened to our performance? 84 milliseconds, fantastic. Notice the order is no longer deterministic, right? Because they're each sleeping for a random time. They could take different times to respond. And therefore, we're getting them in whatever order they came back. 79 milliseconds, 80, 68, 97. 
OK. And the reason we're capped at 100 here is because my random sleep is up to 100 here. All right, no locks, no condition variables, and no callbacks. I find this code very easy to read. Um, with experience, you will too. And in particular, think again about how you would make this change in your favorite language, if it's not Go. Google Search 2.2. Um, we don't want to wait too long for these results. And you know, let's 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 say that 80 milliseconds is as long as you want to wait. So again, look right here. I'm going to flip back and forth. All I'm changing here is I'm adding this timeout. Um, I'm using another standard time package thing, time dot after 80 milliseconds. What that's doing is it's returning a channel. Timeout is a channel. And that channel is going to emit a value after 80 milliseconds. Great. So in my loop, I'm going to receive results and append them to results just like I did before. And I'm going to have another case in my select, which is did the timeout fire? If so, I'll print timed out and return immediately. So this is capping my search to 80 milliseconds. Let's see. 56 milliseconds. 80 seconds. Oh, timed out, and we got a short result set. Right? When video was too slow, it didn't make the bar. We don't get it. Uh, you can imagine doing this for ads or various other backends. And you'll see that if, as I go along, we get some timeouts. Sometimes we get the results. Sometimes we're really unlucky. I'm trying to get one which fires the empty result. It does happen every now and then. Anyway. All right. But losing results is bad. Right? So how do we deal with this problem? Well. We throw money at the problem is how we do it. How do we avoid timing out a request to slow backends? We replicate. And we send requests to multiple replicas and use the first response. Let's see how that looks. So this is a different bit of code, but with some of the same types. We've got a result and search type. And I have this new function called first. First is going to take a query string and any number of, rep of searches as replicas. Now I've got a new bit of new syntax here, which is this dot, dot, dot search. That's uh, our syntax for variadic functions, like printf. Right? So this is give me any number of searches. And inside this uh, function, that's just available as a slice. I can range over it. I can call len and, cat, uh, len and so on. Um, so what it first is doing is I'm creating a channel of results as big as the number of replicas. I have a little closure here, which is search a replica. It takes you know, the index i and issues and uh, invokes the query on search number i and sends the result on a channel. In my loop, I just fire off that number of Go routines, one for each replica, and then I return the first result. What about the other Go routines? Well, those other Go routines are going to go ahead and do their job, and they'll eventually return, and they'll dump their data in this channel. And when they're all done, there won't be any references to this channel, and the garbage collector will get it. Everything will just clean up. Right? Uh, that is one of the reasons buffer channels are also important, is you want to make sure your Go routines do exit. Uh, Go doesn't garbage like, collect Go routines. They have to exit on their own. So you do have to know when your functions are going to stop. Right? So now we can take this first function and put it together with our Google example. All right, so here's our replicated backends. We've got web1, web2, image1, image2, and so on. Now look how much our function changed. Not a whole lot. Right? We still have these three goes, and we're still sending a channel. And just instead of saying web of query, we have first query web1, web2, and first of this. Not a lot changed. And if we run this, uh, if I run this, really, there we go. All right, well, here we got our results. We'll occasionally still see a timeout. But for the most part, you'll see we brought the latency tail in. Actually, I forgot to show you earlier on the first example that you can get quite fast. But you can see here, we're seeing fewer. We have one here at 80. But we're seeing fewer at the long tail. And you can bring your tail in this way uh, by using, by descending to the multiple back ends. Um, the, really, the point here is composition. That I define this first function. And it's just, from the point of view of this code, it's just a regular function, something you can vote synchronously. I don't, don't have to know all the business it's doing in the background. I don't have to know that it's got go routines and channels going on and using this parallelism. Um, and most Go APIs are synchronous. Like, you know, here my Google search blocks and returns these results, right? You only expose channels and stuff if you need to. Um, mostly, you want simple APIs. So our RPR, if you look at the Go standard packages, 
the RPC interfaces and things like HTTP.get all just block. If you need asynchrony, you use concurrency primitives. And this makes your code simpler. It really does. It really helps you deal with concurrency in a very natural way. All right. There's a lot more to the language that, I'm, that I haven't gone into. As I said, I'm running off the Go tour here, and this is all online at tour.golang.org. Uh, there are these other built-in types, arrays, maps, and slices, um, that give you sort of uh, common data structures and uh, that have a lot of nice primitives built in. Uh, struct and interface embedding is an important feature. This is sort of Go's answer to inheritance. Go doesn't have classes and inheritance. It has types. But a struct type can embed another one um, and interfaces as well. And that essentially provides some automatic delegation of the methods on that type while still keeping their states separate. Go see the Go docs for details on that. Defer, panic, and recover. This is really the stuff around Go's error handling model. You can, within your function, defer a function to be valued when the function exits. Uh, a little bit like scoped stuff in C or C++, but it's really tied to when the function exits. And this is how you might close a file or unlock a mutex. Um, and that plays particularly well with panic and recover, which are other parts of the error handling story in Go. Type switches and reflection. Go has full-blown reflections. And it also, you can, uh, has runtime type in for it, it, information. You can look at, uh, you can ask Go whether a particular value implements a given type. You can also have a switch statement on that. Uh, and that gives you some new ways to program as well. Uh, finally, there's the Go tool, um, which is really part of the build system, but it's also the package fetching system. It's really nice. Try it. Download Go. Um, I think you'll be impressed with just how easy it is to get, get up and running. Um, some references. I'll leave these up. Uh, Golang.org is the home page. The language spec is surprisingly readable. It's pretty short, actually, uh, and gives you a good sense of how the language hangs together. The package documentation, we did a lot of work to try and make that very readable. The packages are pretty thorough, but I think each one is pretty easy to understand on its own. Um, there are a couple of nice code walks. Uh, share memory by communicating talks more about the concurrency model. First class functions talks about the function types. And then the blog has a lot of great articles, in particular one about defer, panic, and recover. And uh, that's it. Thank you. Come up to the mic. Samir, can you flip back to 17, please? Certainly. Right. Uh, so I go back. Yep, that's fine. <coughs> the syntax for a slice is beginning position length. Ah, this syntax here? No, go down to lines 17 and 18. Yes. So what this is doing, if I had said... So that begins at 0 for length, a, length of A divided by 2 entries. Yes. OK, uh, that wasn't... Uh, uh, well, it's, if it's either that or... It's either that or the... Or, the or there's a typo that. by 1. No, no, it's, it's correct. But it's, um, you're, you're right. The question is, you know, is it the index or is, the, is it the length? Yes. Um, Yes, I think it's actually the index, but it I would can't have to be the index no, because the then you would be double summing one of the right. middle term. Easy way to tell because we have code we can use is uh, type it in, right? So if I say zero, I don't get anything, right? Right. Yes. Well, no, my my comment was simple. It's either the length or it's the two lines are inconsistent. No, it's fine. <laughs> Uh, hi. So I think one of the biggest hurdles to people switching to a new language is always the availability of standard libraries yes. um, and other tools that they, you know, currently they might be relying on a huge array of Java libraries or something else. So, so what can you tell us about the availability of libraries for Go at the moment and also what interoperability, if any, there is with other languages? Uh, so in terms of availability of libraries, um, there is a package dashboard which provides information on the various packages available and where. Um, I can try and find that uh, maybe after the after the Q and A. And uh, in terms of interoperability, Go works great with C. There's a C Go uh, function that allows you to interface with those. That's great for you know, numerical libraries and such. 
Uh, interoperability with other languages is a little harder. Um, typically, I end up doing things like RPC. But uh, I don't know what sort of support there is for SWIG and other sort of interfacing. Typically, you want the Go road runtime to be able to manage itself. So you know, the challenge, as soon as you start interfacing with other languages, is that they, they want to have threads and signals, too. Thank you. Oh, yes. There you go. I made a request for the Q&A session. Yes. All right. I'd like to ask two questions, if I can. Sure. Uh, the first is, like, if I have a program that um, fires off a bunch of Go routines and they maybe recursively fire off a bunch of other Go routines, is, do you have a, what's your kind of pattern for canceling all of them at once? Do you have like a multicast channel or? Yeah, so cancellation, you need to be explicit. It's not, it's not a language thing. But channels provide a lot, a lot of help there. Um, so you can have a channel that's then possibly even the same channel passed down to everyone. And then if, when you're not interested anymore, you can just close the channel. And that provides a simple signal to everyone that if that channel is closed, oh, they, okay. they can select on that, you know, just give up and exit. Um, if you don't want to use close, you do end up, you'd, you'd have to manage it a little more explicitly by keeping track of how many children you're creating at each level and sending them an explicit close signal on a channel. That may be better in some cases, depending on what you're trying to do. Okay, that makes sense. I guess my second question is a little harder for me to state. It, it, I'm going to try, though. Um, let's say I was a function that received a vertex as you defined it, and then I just hand it off to somebody else. And I'm using one of these method receivers you talked about. So am I going to get um, this this uh, object, and somehow when I hand it to the next guy, is he going to see my version of string rather than the one I was handed? Your version of string? Well, I was imagining st I had used a method receiver to like override the somebody I, else's. So Within the same program, you'll both be talking about the same type, yes? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, so if he's using a vertex type, then you both agree that it's the vertex type with that Oh, okay, so. Right. Uh, if it's, say, a channel of interface types, right, stringers, right, he'll still get the right thing because you're sending him that value, and your vertex has your string method, you know, has its string me method. And the receiver, if he just knows he's getting stringers, he can call string on it. And it will dispatch properly to the vertex method. Yeah, I was. I guess maybe I was a little confused about the syntax. The the fact that my stringer, you know, definition was in my file. Does that affect kind of the whole program, or does it affect sort of like is it in kind of like uh, file oh, scope, if you will? Or? I, th I think I know the question you're getting at. You, the yeah. question is, can you attach a method to someone else's type? Yeah, yeah. No, you 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 can attach you attach methods to type in your own package, right? So you know the, the definition of a type is still local. Um, but what you can do is this embedding stuff, which I haven't gotten into too much. So let me, let me just skip back to that to make it a little clearer. Uh, so here, I'm, at, I'm just defining vertex and I'm giving it a method. I can't go and attach uh, a method to a type, something defined in Fumped. But what I can do if, um, let me come up with a better example. Say I have an image.rgb value and I want to attach a method to that. I can't def add something to image.rgb. RGB directly so that some third party can see that method. But I can define my own type that embeds image to RGB, right? And therefore, it will get all of its methods. And then I can add my own methods on top of that and override its methods as well. That, that's quite helpful. And I think just to, if, to make it clear for me, like if there were like a second file that was in package main that tried to do what you have in lines 9 through 11, that's a compiler error, I assume. Well, so that's if there were a second file that also did, was package main that also defined main, yeah, then that would be illegal. Uh, but do you mean main, it, def it defined this function in lines 9 through 11. This, oh, this, ex this, this uh, one here? No, if receiver. it's in the same package, it's all compiled together. If it's in the same package, then it's together, right? So then you can distribute the, a package definition over several files. Go, go with, you know, files really are just scoping for your import statements. And, uh, but you can Does a duplicate definition of lines 9 through 11 appear twice in the same ah, package? Ah, if it appears twice, question. of course. Yeah, yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Oh, right. I have swag for those who ask questions. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot. So, thank you. Sorry, do, do you ask the other question? No. He just wants swag. <laughs> 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 yes. <laughs> yes, all of a sudden we get more questions. Fantastic. I should take back his because I flubbed his question, but still. Go ahead. So, firstly, uh, I really like the structure of your talk. Congratulations. It's just nice to have a straight to the code kind of talk. Very enjoyable. I'm glad um, it worked out, actually. <laughs> yeah. Um, so my question is kind of multi -pronged. It's the, the core of what I want to get at is how much does Google use Go? Uh, but sort of around that is like, and different people will say different things on this, but garbage collector languages have a bit of a stigma for the heart attack. Uh, and uh, I've heard some people go on about C and C-based languages being the best for 
web serving for that reason. Um, so where is the, I mean, I, I think Go has a lot of sweet spots, but it's still garbage collected. So how much is it used and how does that fit in with the garbage collection? Excellent questions. Um, I mean, certainly there are people inside and outside of Google apprehensive about using garbage collected languages for systems programming. Um, so the first question of how much it's used in Google, I can only speak to it a bit. Um, the biggest uh, sort of, we have a big use within YouTube uh, as a database proxy, and they've actually open sourced their code. So let me see if I can pull that up. It's a system called Vitesse. Um, and they are serving pretty much some large fraction of YouTube database queries go through a Go program, right? Um, so Vitesse scaling MySQL databases for the web. You can go look at the source. So they at least have uh, managed to make this work at scale. Garbage collection is, of course, a challenge. And there's been a lot of work to improve garbage collection speed. One of the critical things about Go is that it gives you a fair amount of control over memory layout. And so you can avoid allocating in a lot of cases. And that's something you don't always have the option to do in other languages. Other techniques for managing your garbage, like recycling, also, of course, apply to Go. Um, and so you do need to be aware that gar the garbage collector in any runtime is a service. And you can overload that service. So you can either tune the service, which you know we're working to improve it, and you can also reduce the load. And Go gives you a fair amount of control over that. Um, yeah. And swag. Yeah. <laughs> Stay armed. My question was more of a nitpick of the convention. Sure. Why are methods uppercase, starting ah, with uppercase? I didn't get into this. So Rob Pike had a great talk called Public Static Final Void. Um, you'll notice none of those, <laughs> yes, none of those appear in Go. Um, Go's visibility restrictions are based entirely on whether your method starts in uppercase or lowercase letter, what? or type, or symbol, yes. Um, everything is essentially package visibility, like you would be used to in Java. Within a package, you can see everything. Outside of the package, you can see things that have exported names, like capital string or capital vertex. Um, this sounds odd. It turns out to be really nice. Um, it, you know, your brain starts to map that really fast, and it saves you a lot of typing. Um, so again, this is one of those try it and see. Uh, it's you know people people were upset about Python's and Python's indentation when it came out. We got over it pretty quick. Um, Go is one of those languages you really the best way to know if you're going to like it is to try it, and the tour is a good way to get started or build something simple. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Go is one of those languages that has actually gotten smaller in my experience over time. That it's, I make the comparison to Edward Tufte's pro, uh, pl uh, perspective on you know, visual information. Erase as much as you can and leave what's essential. I think the Go designers really did a lot for that. All right. <laughs> <laughs> if I want to get a stack dump of a running Go program with a bunch of Go routines, how do yes. I get it? Uh, you call runtime.stack. And inside. Package. Yeah. And it will pull it everything, all the Go routines. Yeah. Actually, I can even, why don't I show off a bit of a documentation? Because that's actually, you've given me a good opportunity here. So, package documentation. Oh, this is going to get tiny, isn't it? All right, I'll zoom in. Package runtime. Uh, method stack with a Boolean all. Do you want the one you're in, or do you want all of them? Oh. <laughs> then you set that to true. <laughs> Thanks. Sure. Uh, not stack doesn't take a writer because it wants you to. It wants a, a buffer of a particular size. Um, it, 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 yeah, that's how it is. He, he was asking, what, why doesn't it take I.O. Writer? I think it's also that, it, I'm speculating here, they probably didn't want the runtime package to depend on the I.O. package, right? So you'd have to run, define a runtime.writer, which happens to look the same as I.O.writer. So Go's dependency model is strict, and this is important to have the fast build times as well. No cyclic dependencies in packages, right? But interfaces are how you decouple, right? But yes, you, do, you will run into something like this, if it was important to have sort of streaming stack traces, would have just defined a, you know, an interface for that here. 
But what's the difference between parallelism and concurrency? Oh, yay, good question. Parallelism is things that happen at the same time in real time. Concurrency is things essentially that could happen at the same time. So the difference is if I have, I could have a single threaded program that's making a bunch of, say, web requests, right? And how that's actually executed is, you know, each of those requests might, you know, write to the socket and then yield to the next one. These are all Go routines that are executing. And then uh, the runtime will then schedule them, you know, each of them to resume when the responses arrive. And in a sense, the web requests are happening really in parallel. Um, but the way I program is purely concurrency, right? I can write things that may not actually happen really in parallel, say that parallel sum. That's only going to be really in parallel if I have two CPUs to run on. If I only have a single CPU, parallel sum will run serially. But I don't have to know that. I just blew your mind. <laughs> I know Go isn't really intended uh, for embedded uh, systems development, but is that something that it could be applied to in future, maybe with a restricted subset of the language? I don't know. I don't have a good answer to that question. So repeat the question. The okay. question is, uh, is Go useful for embedded programming, or could it be? Uh, restricted subset, possibly. Yeah, a restricted subset. I really, I, I really don't know. I'm not. Um, it's, it's hard for me to, uh, for me to answer. I mean, right now, Go works really well for servers. The embedded programming domain is a different set of constraints. I'm not sure what would get in the way, um, but I'm not familiar enough with the embedded domain to be able to comment intelligently about it. I know the idea is to have a, uh, a debugger named Ogle, but um, when you're writing packages for Go, you're typically writing them in, say, C and using the Go bindings. Now, is there, are there any plans to create um, a, a module or create symbols for GDB to help with debugging those packages? I think we do have GDB do support. Do you? Okay. Yeah, I think we do have, you know, Elf. Uh, uh, let me look it up out, uh, offline, but I think we do, we do we, you can use GDB with Go. Um, it may be that you have to use the GCC Go compiler instead of the 6G compiler. Okay. Okay. Here you go. Um, uh, just some housekeeping, maybe uh, last three, last four questions, um, last five questions, <laughs> one in the back, that's six, and then we'll, we'll, no, no questions back there, or only five. All right. Um, you said um, a thread could have multiple Go routines. Is it possible for a Go routine, you know, how do you, is it possible to preempt a Go routine within a thread? Ah. And, um, well, it's not like you're going to ask two different questions. Well, One is, can I, a Go routine be on multiple threads, and the other is... No, 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 no. Yeah. It's, it's whether, because you have multiple Go routines in a thread, how do you preempt a Go routine? Right. Goes so to the, another current, one the, current, the current implementation is a cooperative scheduler, okay. but the language doesn't constrain to that. So I, you could instead have a, a preemptive scheduler. Right? So you need, you need to write your code as though you could be preempted. The current implementation is cooperative, so your Go routine will run until it blocks or yields or something. How, how would you get preemption when you need some sort of operating system support? Well, you could, I would have to speculate on the details of how that okay. would actually work, yeah. Yep. Yes. All right, can I hand this off to you? Yeah. Awesome. Hi. Uh, question about the syntax. Could you explain the lack of uh, line terminating semicolons and the importance of white space? Ah, sure. Um, essentially, semicolons can be implicit where there are new lines. Okay. Right? So, if, like in the for loop, you saw I did have uh, semicolons uh, separating it there. And you can have semicolons at the end of lines. You can just omit them. They're implied. Uh, uh, are there potential, like in the case of JavaScript, any uh, pitfalls? I'm not sure what pitfalls you're referring to. That's uh, not, not someone who does much. Returns, functions. breaks, and continues? Uh, not typically, no. I mean, I can screw with the indentation stuff, and things still work. Um, but uh, it's. Uh, one cut. So, how do I put this? There are no pitfalls around white space, but Go does provide standard formatting. There's a GoFumped tool that formats Go programs in a standard way, and that is that's part of sort of the build and, and run. To, uh, sorry, it's part of the environment of building Go programs. It's one of the things that helps a get rid of a lot of confusion and annoyance about style. 
because uh, it at least removes sort of the consistency question about style, like consistent formatting of how you format your program. And B, it makes, means that programs that, tools that manipulate programs, like there's a go fix tool that helps port people to new APIs, um, that can work with minimal disruption to your program. Thank you. Well, I actually have two questions. One is regarding in the example, when you pass an object through this uh, channel, right? Do you pass really the value? It means you, you serialize it and deserialize it on the other end, or you really pass a pointer within your in-ground time? You are passing the value, but so often what you might do is actually pass a pointer. So Go has pointers. I didn't really go into that here. Right. Um, so you could actually pass, you would pass a pointer down, down the channel if you wanted to pass something big. Right. So if so I pass a pointer, can I still access it within, still within the same scope? Shared memory, yeah. So you can mess See? that. You can easily mess that up. The, go to, the language doesn't prevent you from doing that. So I still have to use mutex, et cetera, to ensure uh, the oh, no. concurrent access. The convention is that when you pass someone uh, a pointer or something over a channel, you're transferring ownership, and it's very easy not to make that mistake. If you really want to like spread ownership, often what you're doing is you're constructing these things from the same value, right? If you want to have a uh, an object uh, value that's truly shared. Right, so you have to know whether you're transferring ownership or you're sharing ownership when you program. Um, um, a second question is, you know, you know, in the web, you also um, Wikipedia also describe this is uh, this is CSP uh, kind of uh, para paradigm. It's sort of like a deal of this active uh, object uh, paradigm, active object actor, actor. You know, like in well, actor, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like in the ACE. Uh, framework, they have this active object kind of actor. They have a class called actor. So actor really take uh, full control of this all these uh, asynchronous uh, processes. And um, so w w what do you think of this uh, pros and cons of these two approaches, other than programming simplicity? I, I don't have a lot of experience using the actor model myself. I know it's pretty popular. Uh, I think Scala and Erlang are both actor-based languages, and they've certainly gained in popularity. Um, I'm going to talk about what I think I know about the actor model, and you can tell me if I'm wrong, uh, <laughs> which is that essentially an actor has a set of messages it can receive and actions based on those messages, and it can spawn some finite number of new actors and some finite number of new messages. Um, in a sense, what you've done is said that uh, information, you know, you've got these concurrently executing actors, and they're communicating by passing messages. But you've lost sort of the fact that you have expli these explicit channels that can be, say, shared among many senders and receivers. You'd have to model that as a separate actor, presumably, right? Um, and Go has certain other things, like I can pass a channel over a channel. And this is really useful in request response protocols, right? I have some Go routine that's a server of some data, right? And I'm sending it a request with some parameters. And I'm sending it a channel on which it'll send the response. This is very much analogous to what you do in a distributed system when sending an RPC. I send the RPC and I expect a response back on my channel, on my socket. Um, so Go lets you build programs like that. I don't know how easy it is to do that in actors. I also never had it say inherit from actor in my program. I just said Go. So <laughs> it, honestly, uh, I, I'm not familiar enough deeply with the actor programming. I haven't programmed with an actor framework, so I can't comment well on the distinction. But you know, for me, I find that Channels and Go routines actually let you build a lot of different kinds of concurrency arrangements well. I'm sure Actor does too, but I don't know if it comes as naturally. So. Yeah, it just seems to me that, uh, you know, it, peop whenever there is a simplicity of programming, peop there is a very, the flip side of the simplicity is it tends to be abused. So it seems to me we can easily create tons of coroutines, routines and I, I think uh, the wrong time still have to flip through this uh, logical units. So you kind of lose some uh, localities or something that could be done more optimal if you write more code. You can write simple code, but sometimes you lose some kind of control. That's certainly a trade-off, right? It's certainly a trade Go routines encourage you to write you know, serial code, simple code. But for example, in my parallel sum, if I had done it sort of like merge sort and split and split and split until I had just two things to sum and I summed them together and then I summed those two again, you're right, I would have had, you know, however many number of Go routines, you know, recursively summing this thing and then merging them all, passing that all over channels. That's a lot of overhead to do something I can do as a straight line loop. So you do have to be intelligent about how you split up your problems. Now, where I find that I'm introducing a Go routine is primarily when I start needing a select. When I have some thread of execution that needs to take two different kinds of inputs. 
say, requests and a, t a time ticker, or it needs to manage requests to some back set of backends and requests from clients. Like I have, I tend to end up structuring my Go programs a lot like small distributed systems, but they hang together really nicely, right? Because I've got type checking throughout. I know that it's going to ho hold together, and it's very easy to reason about that code. Um, so yes, you have to be careful about how you structure your program and you know, not overuse these concurrency primitives. I certainly did at the beginning. When I first started playing with Go, I was channel crazy. I wanted to use it for everything. And I sort of had to relearn that, OK, there's a trade-off between when you want to use these primitives and when you don't. I do a lot of programs that you do a lot of I.O. So clearly, if I have something that's going to block an I.O., throw it in a Go routine so I can get on with other work. Right? If you're doing CPU-bound stuff, you have to be careful, and you have to think about how you're distributing your work over your CPUs to the extent that you want to, you want to create reasonable chunks of work so that then you get those scheduling, uh, you know, the opportunity to schedule in between. Um, I think there's opportunity for sort of research there in the future, which is how do we automatically break up a problem uh, using this? And I think a language like Go is a good substrate on which to do investigations of that kind. Thank okay. you. Hi. Um, so shared memory is really nice and convenient. What kinds of uh, primitives or library support does Go currently have for distributed memory programming? I mean, distributed memory like Message passing interface. Yeah, multiple. You, know? pro you mean multiple processes on the same machine, or just, and just separate separate nodes? So, you know, like yeah. like I've got my MPI program and I want to port it Good over question. to Go. There used to be a NetChan package which provided a channel abstraction to the network, and Rob wasn't happy with it. So uh, I think he plans to look at this again because so you know obviously there's like RPC packages and stuff, but those aren't really getting what you're talking about. The fundamental thing you'd like to have is the ability to say pass a channel over a channel and the receiver is on a different machine, and when it writes to the channel I gave it, it comes back to me, right, and just looks transparently. Sure. That doesn't exist yet, right? But it's certainly one of those things where we're very interested in making it work and work well because we think it can give you a new way to program distributed systems in a really nice way. Okay. Questions more around direction, having used the, the software. What are the one or two key things do you think it's missing <clears throat> and what's coming up next in the next revision? Because you talked about Go 1 and, and then kind of the release cycle that right. people could see from that. Um, Go 1 is intended to be stable for some time. Uh, I don't think the language is going to change a lot for at least a year or two. Um, you know, certainly the biggest ask from people in the community is where are the generics? And I'll refer you to all the discussions there are. Uh, both in the FAC and in the discussion groups, because it's been discussed extensively. Um, is that something that you want to see in the, in, the, in, the, in the language? I have been very productive with the language as it stands, right? Writing infrastructure within Google. So I, certainly I'm happy with it. You know, there are cases where I could imagine introducing uh, a generic type, but often I find I don't need it. Um, and so I think the focus should be right now on being productive with the language that stands and using that to identify what's any deficiencies that are there, right? And in particular with, with running and using programs in a language, running them in production, you know, obviously garbage collection is a concern that many people share. Um, so before the language changes more, we want to see how well it runs, right, and see if it really generalizes the way we think it does. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.